Welcome to today's virtual seminar, Finding Hope, Changing the Climate Crisis Conversation. I'm Amanda Sardonis. I'm with the Environment and Natural Resources Program at the Belfer Center, one of the sponsors of today's event. And I wanna thank our fellow Harvard Kennedy School co-sponsors, the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics and Public Policy, the Arctic Initiative at the Belfer Center, and the Climate, Energy and Environment Professional Interest Council, which is run by our great students. Um, we are recording today's seminar and we're gonna post it on the ENRP website. So for every, anyone who registered, you'll get that link to the recording um, once it's posted. Uh, and today's seminar is the second in our spring semester series, uh, Science in the Media, which is organized by our ENRP senior fellow and distinguished science journalist, Christine Russell, who is our moderator today. And I'm gonna go right into the introduction um, of Chris and uh, get this event started. So Chris is an award-winning journalist who's written about science, health, the environment, and climate for four decades. Chris has written for Scientific American, The Atlantic, Columbia Journalism Review, and other publications, and is a former national reporter for The Washington Post. She's the past president of the Council for the Advancement of Science Writing and of the National Association of Science Writers. And in 2017, she co-chaired the World Conference of Science Journalists. And in 2020, she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Scientists. Over to you, Chris. Thanks so much, Amanda. It's really a great privilege today to have Dr. Catherine Hayhoe with us for the webinar, Finding Hope, Changing the Climate Crisis Conversation. Dr. Hayhoe is not only one of the world's leading climate scientists, but she is one of the premier climate communicators. She is chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy and a distinguished professor and chair at Texas Tech University. Dr. Hayhoe is the author of a recent book, Saving Us, have a copy, uh, a climate scientist case for hope and healing in a divided world, which talks about why climate change matters and what we can do to fix it. She's received the American Geophysical Union's Climate Communication Prize, the Stephen Snyder Climate Communication Award, the United Nations Champion of the Earth Award, and been named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, among many other credentials. So Dr. Hayhoe will talk about how to reframe the climate, climate conversation to focus on possible solutions that provide hope rather than despair. She will share stories about how to move beyond the barriers that contribute to climate denialism and transition toward positive actions based on shared values and concerns. So welcome Dr. Hayhoe, it's great to have you today. Thank you so much. It is so good to be with you here virtually. Welcome everyone. And as Christine mentioned, I'll be giving a short presentation and about half an hour, 35 minutes or so, and then we'll be taking your questions afterwards. And we're going to be doing that using Poll Everywhere, which if you've seen me speak before, you might've seen this before, but we're gonna start off with um, some interactive activities so you'll get a hang for it. So I love the title. Um, of this talk that Christine, you chose, of uh, finding hope. Where do we find hope today, especially in the climate crisis conversation? So to begin our discussion, I would like you to go on your phone, your tablet, your computer to pollev.com slash my name, Catherine. Now they're gonna put a link in the chat that you can click on in Zoom if you want to, or you can just type it in. You have to make sure to spell Catherine with two A's. And when you get there, it will ask you to introduce yourself, but you don't have to do that. You can just push skip. You don't have to enter a name. When you do, you'll see my first question to you pop up because I get to ask you a few questions before you ask me questions. And my first question to you is, where are you joining us from today? This is a clickable map and you don't have to be in the United States. If you're in Canada, just click across the border where you are. If you're over on this side of the ocean or that side, just click in that direction and we'll assume that you're over there, not on a ship. Oh, I see that we do have a few people joining us from Europe, quite a few from Canada, Ontario, I see. Looks like um, perhaps Manitoba or Saskatchewan, maybe even British Columbia. Uh, oh, somebody else from Texas where I am, somebody from Alaska is joining us. And of course, obviously a lot of people from Massachusetts, but not everybody, that's great. So good representation from coast to coast and even from co across the continent and beyond. All right. 
now that you're getting the hang of this, I see people's dots are still coming in here. And this is the way that we're gonna be collecting questions at the end. So just leave this window open. Since I'm gonna ask you another question now, I'll ask you one more question as we go along, I'll ask you a few questions at the end and then you can ask me questions. So as we go along, um, or before we start, I should say, I want to ask you something else. And this time, it's a little harder. I need you to answer with a word rather than clicking on the map. With one word, and if you have to use two words, you have to join them with a dot or a dash. Why is that? It's because it's going to make a word cloud. When I say climate change to you, how do you feel? Give me a word about how you feel. Anxious, overwhelmed, despondent, tired, terrified, resigned, panic, apprehensive, puzzled, that's a good one, urgent, overwhelmed, disappointed, guilty, stressed, disenfranchised. It's no surprise that you feel this way. All you have to do, all any of us have to do is read the headlines. I don't read climate fiction because the papers I read are bad enough. Reality is that we are conducting a truly unprecedented experiment with our planet. As far back as we can go in the history of our planet, we have never seen this much carbon going into the atmosphere this quickly. So no wonder we feel this way. We have every reason to feel this way. If you feel anxious, if you feel scared, if you feel urgency, if you feel frustrated and worried, all of these feelings are completely justified responses to the situation that we find ourselves in today. Why does this experiment that we're conducting matter? And how long have we been doing this for? We've been doing this since the dawn of the industrial era. When we figured out how to dig up massive amounts of coal, gas, and oil out of the ground and burn it, producing heat trapping gases that are wrap building up in the atmosphere, essentially wrapping an extra blanket around our planet. Over the course of human civilization, the average temperature of our planet was as stable as that of the human body. Our human body temperature goes up and down by a few tenths of a degree over the course of a day. And the average temperature of the planet went up and down by a few tenths of a degree over the course of human civilization. Yet today, it has increased by more than one degree Celsius, which is two degrees Fahrenheit. And just like our body would, if we were running a two degree Fahrenheit fever, we are starting to feel the impacts. We know that something is wrong. We can see that Wherever we live, we have a pair of natural weather dice, so to speak. And we always have a chance naturally of rolling a double six, a heat wave, a hurricane, a wildfire, a flood, a storm. But we can see that something's happening. Decade by decade as the world warms, it's as if it's sneaking in and taking one of these numbers on our natural weather dice and turning it into a six, taking another one and turning it into a six, and then taking another one and turning it into a seven. And all of a sudden we've got temperatures pushing 50 degrees Celsius in Canada. We've got three 500 year flood events occurring in three years in Houston, Texas. We've got wildfires burning ac across Australia, across Western North America, across Greece. We've got unprecedented disasters happening everywhere we look as climate change loads the weather dice against us. And that's why I think a really good way to think about this is global weirding. Not global warming, but weirding. Our heat waves are more dangerous. Our tropical storms are stronger and they have more rain associated with them. Our droughts are longer and more intense. Our wildfires are burning greater area. Why does this matter? It doesn't only matter because of the planet. It matters because of us. All of these impacts are directly affecting the quantity and the quality of the water that we need to drink. We can't survive without it. It's affecting the air that we breathe and we can't survive without that. It affects the nutritional quality and the quantity of the food that we eat, which is also essential to our survival. 
Climate change affects all of our infrastructure that we don't think about until it doesn't work. Our electricity grid, our internet systems, our water systems, our transportation systems, our built environment, all of that was constructed based on a planet that no longer exists. All of our building codes, all of our design standards are for the past, not the future. And this even affects the situation that we find ourselves in today. The IPCC report came out last Monday, and Christine and I will talk briefly about that at the end of this presentation. But one of the most powerful moments in the final meeting of the Working Group 2 scientists where they were approving the report for release on Sunday night came from a Ukrainian climate scientist. And this is what she said. She said, as she logged into the Zoom meeting, hearing the missiles overhead, she said, human-induced climate change and the war on Ukraine have the same roots, our dependence on fossil fuels. We will not surrender in Ukraine, and we hope that the world will not surrender in building a climate-resilient future. Climate change is not a standalone issue. It is intimately linked with geopolitical conflict, with resource scarcity, with the well-being of every human on this planet. The way I think about it is this, climate change is not just a climate issue. We care about it because it affects our infrastructure, our economy, our energy. It affects our water, our natural resources, our health. It affects our food, our biodiversity, and our risk of political conflict. And most of all, it is a justice and an equity issue. Those who have done the least to contribute to this problem are the ones who are bearing the brunt of the impacts. And that is not fair. So what does that mean? And what implications does this have for our communication? Well, you can see one right here. Climate change is not something we have to silo into the environmental pages of a newspaper. We can talk about climate change if we're talking about energy. We can talk about it if we're talking about the economy. We can talk about it if we're talking about water, about health, about food, about nature. We can talk about it when we're talking about political conflict and absolutely when we're talking about moral and ethical issues, when we're talking about socioeconomic inequalities and racial inequalities and gender inequalities. All of these are climate issues. This is why we care. So the bottom line, and this is something I've said before, and somebody actually literally took it and wrote it on a t-shirt and sent me a picture of it. <laughs> so I didn't do this. And I don't know where you can get these t-shirts. I only have the picture. But what that means is we don't have to be any certain type of person to care about climate change. We don't have to be a stereotypical person who cares about environmental issues to care about climate change. We only have to be one thing, and that is a human being living on this planet. It isn't about saving the planet. The planet will still be here after we're gone. It is about saving us. So gone is the need to convince people to care for the same reasons we do. Gone is the drive to recruit people to our tribe. Gone is our motivation to coerce or guilt or shame others into acting as if they don't have any reason to act other than how others see them. And this, you might need to sit with this for a while. You might need to sort of reflect on this for, you know, as you're taking a walk, as you're doing the dishes, as you're doing some gardening or spending some time um, with the family or folding laundry, because these are some really profound issues that has taken me a long time to unpack myself. It's okay if someone cares for a different reason than I care. That's okay. It's okay if they're not part of my tribe. They can still care. And coercing, guilting, or shaming is not going to provide long-term change. Rather, showing them how who they already are is the perfect person to care. That is what is going to help us all act together. So to put it a different way, whoever we already are, is already the perfect person to care about and act on climate change. And if we don't realize it, because there's a lot of people obviously who don't realize it, I'm not naive, I see those people every day. What is our job? Our job is to help them connect the dots between what, who, and where they already love and how will we find out what that is by listening to them rather than talking at them? 
how climate change affects who they love, where they love, what they love, and how climate action benefits them. That's our job. So rather than beginning with the sciencey facts, begin by trying to figure out what we have in common. And if you don't know, it's a time to ask questions and listen rather than talk. Connect the dots to how climate change is affecting what we already care about. And then always, always offer positive, constructive solutions because we could be very worried about something, but if we don't know what to do about it, we won't do anything. And the end result is exactly the same as if we were the most dyed in the wool dismissive on climate change. Because it doesn't matter what our opinion is, what matters is what we do. So that's why we always need to talk about solutions as well. So the reason I wrote Saving Us, my book, is because wherever I go, whoever I'm speaking to, I hear the same two questions. And the first question I hear is, how do I talk about this to my neighbor, my family member, my elected official, somebody I work with, my kids? How do I talk about this issue? Climate changes and we get worried. And when we look around, we feel like, well, most people aren't as worried as I am and they need to be more worried. So I'm gonna load up on all the scary facts I can find. And believe me, there are plenty of scary facts out there that are 100% accurate. I'm gonna load up on the scary facts about the ice sheets melting and the permafrost thawing and the polar bears starving, and I'm going to dump it on them. Here's the thing though. If we don't know what to do about the problem, more scary data just causes our self-defense mechanisms to kick in and we reject it even more in action results. One of the most important books that I read a few years ago is a book by a neuroscientist called The Influential Mind. It has nothing to do with climate change on the surface, but underneath I think it has everything to do with climate change. And this is one of the things she says in the book. Tally Sherrod is the author. Fear, now she's just talking about how our brain works. She's not talking about climate change, but you can see the connection. Fear and anxiety will cause us to withdraw, to freeze, to give up rather than take action. And so climate just changes more. And what happens, we feel more anxious, we feel more frustrated, we feel more depressed, we feel more panicked. It is a self-reinforcing cycle. Another thing we often do and people often say this and they say, oh, you wrote a book. Now I know how to talk to all those people who reject the science of climate change. We often fixate on the gap between people who say it isn't real and people who say it is. And of course, this is a serious gap because we've known since the 1800s that it's real and it's us and it's serious. In the United States, this gap is 25%. But this is not the biggest gap we have. The gap between people who say it's real and people who think it matters to them is 30%. That's a bigger gap. And if you don't think it matters to you, why would you ever want to do anything to fix it, right? And then there's another gap. The gap between people who say it's real and people who are activated, who know what to do and are doing it, you know what that gap looks like? 65%. Imagine if everybody who agreed that climate change is real and who is worried about it, imagine if all those people were activated. We would live in a different world. So it's not about convincing the holdouts, it's about helping people who are panicked, who are anxious, who are worried, but don't know what to do, helping them understand why it matters here and now and what we can do about it. To put it a different way, how do we feel about climate change? 70% of Americans are worried about it. But 50% feel hopeless and don't know where to start. That is the biggest problem we have. And only 8% are activated. This is the biggest gap, and this is where our communication can make the biggest difference. Another thing people often say to me is, well, I live in a bubble where everybody thinks the same way I do, so how is having a conversation about it gonna help? Well, unless you live in a bubble of the 8%, <laughs> which one or two of you may, but most of you don't, you are in the perfect place because you're surrounded by people who are worried, but they don't know what to do. 
And how do we start that? With having conversations. Our issues are that we don't understand why it matters so urgently here and now. We don't understand how it's about the safety of our home. It's about the economic opportunities in our city. It's about the disparity and the impact of heat waves on low versus higher income um, neighborhoods in our own city. It's about the health of our kids and the air they're breathing in. And we don't know what we can do to fix it. So let's flip this around. If these are the problems, what should we be talking about? We should be talking not about the ice sheets and the polar bears, but about what's happening here and now where we live and what real solutions look like. That's what we need to talk about. Now, the first one, the idea that it doesn't matter to me, this is actually something that psychologists call psychological distance. And we humans are regrettably very good at psychological distance. If there's a problem that we're confronting, but we don't know what to do about it, we just push it off. And on climate change, we do it in every single way we can. We see climate change as being far away from us in time, the future, not now, distant in space, over there, not here, abstract global average temperature instead of heat-related hospitalizations and deaths in my city, for example, or houses flooded or people breathing in wildfire smoke. And we see it as irrelevant to our primary concerns. Oh, it's over there in the environment column. It's in the environment section. It's in the environment part of the news. I'll tell you who does a good job with making it relevant is the BBC. When I turn into the BBC news sometimes, their international news, I've seen as many as five different stories mention climate change in relation to industry, politics, um, usually a disaster story as well, um, and solutions. We need to weave it into everything because this is the biggest problem we have. And I'll, I have data to show that. Do we think global warming is happening according to the Yale Program on Climate Communication? Yes, it's happening. Most of these places are orange. Anything orangey colored is more than 50%. The darker color, the more people say yes. Yes, it's happening. Is it going to harm non-human species? Distant in terms of what? Relevance. Yes. Is it going to harm people who are distant in terms of time in the future? Yes. Will it harm people who live over there? Yes, probably. Will it harm you. It's blue. The map is blue, except for places with some of the most concerned people groups. What demographics are most concerned in the United States? Hispanic Catholics. Now you might say, oh, of course, the Pope. But it turns out that white Catholics are least concerned. White Catholics actually beat out evangelical Christians by one percentage point. <laughs> so Hispanic Catholics and Native Americans, very concerned about climate change. And you see this in the map. But most of us, we don't think it's going to affect us personally. So when we speak, we have to bring this issue close. Psychological proximity rather than distance. It's now, it's here, it's concrete, and it's relevant. We don't understand why it matters. We don't know what we can do to fix it. And these are the two things we need to talk about. How do we address solutions? People are willing to change if they think that what they do will make a difference. And the word for this, the social science word, is efficacy. If I think what I do can make a difference, I'll do it. But most people feel a crippling lack of efficacy. Why? Because we're told there's this global problem that every single person in the world contributes to that could mean the end of human civilization as we know it. That is what is literally on the block. And what am I supposed to do? Change my light bulbs and recycle. We know instinctively, and don't get me wrong, yes, I have changed my light bulbs, and yes, I do love to recycle. So don't quote me as saying I don't, you know, that those aren't important. Of course they're important, but we know instinctively they're not going to fix a global crisis. Changing our light bulbs will not fix a global crisis. And so some of the most anxious and depressed and frustrated people I know are people who have done every single thing that they can do to reduce their personal carbon footprint. And then you hear that there's airlines running 3,000 empty flights just to keep their gate assignment. And you think, what is the point? We lack efficacy. How do we tackle psychological distance and build efficacy? We do it by doing the one thing that we're not actually doing. What are we not doing that affects change? 
I left you with this map. Do we think global warming will harm you personally? But there's one map that's darker blue. And it relates to how do we turn this around? Do you ever talk about it? Dark blue. Seattle and San Francisco, they barely skate by, but they still have a long way to go. We need this to be purple, not dark blue. All of us need to be talking about this because it affects all of us. What are we going to talk about? Again, how, it affect, how climate change affects us and what we can do to fix it. Why do we care about climate change? Because it affects every aspect of our lives. It affects our water, our food, the safety of our homes, our geopolitical conflicts, our economy, our health. I was in Iowa a few months ago, virtually, and I was asked, how do you talk about polar bears in Iowa? And I said, you don't. In Iowa, you talk about farming. Now, okay, technically this is cotton and it is in Texas. Talk about farming in Texas too. If you live in California, you talk about wildfires or Oregon or Washington State or British Columbia. If you live in British Columbia or if you live in Texas, you also, or if you live in the Northeast, you talk about flooding. You talk about health and air pollution. Why do we care about climate change? We talk about who we are and what we care about. As I say in my book, you know, you could love beach vacations and you can start a conversation about climate change over how sea level rise threatens our beaches. You could be a wine connoisseur and you could start conversations over how climate change is affecting the quality of our wine. I can start conversations over things I genuinely care about. And I do care about beaches. I do care about wine. I also care about knitting and I've started conversations over knitting. I'm a scientist, so I've certainly started conversations over the science because often people are curious about that. I've started conversations over the fact that I live in Texas or the fact that I'm from Canada. I started conversations over the fact that we both might be skiers and we're worried about winter snow. You know, by the end of the century on this current pathway, only one of the previous Winter Olympic venues might be viable. That's a great place to start a conversation. I start a conversation with people over uh, being a parent or a grandparent, caring for kids, and I'm part of a great organization called Science Moms that starts with our shared concern for our kids. I'm a Christian, and so starting from a shared point of faith is a great point of conversation with other Christians, with um, other people uh, from Buddhist faiths, from Muslim faiths, from Jewish faiths. We can all start with those shared values of caring for this planet and caring for those less fortunate than us. So just to make sure you're still with me here, I'm going back to you and I'm asking you a question now. Go back to Pol EV, and I want you to give me another word. And if you need to use more than one word, use a dot or a dash to join the words. I want you to tell me who you are and why you care about climate change. I care about climate change because I am a what? What are you that makes you the perfect person to care about climate change? And I don't want to see the same answers here. I want to see as many different answers as possible. Because who you are is the perfect person to care and you don't have to be anything other than who you are. And I love what I'm already seeing pop up here. You could care because you're a mom, a dad, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle. You could care because you enjoy hiking or kayaking or canoeing or swimming or scuba diving. You could care because of your job. You might be a conservationist, a biologist, a scientist, a public servant. You might care because of what's important to you, that you're a nature lover, or you're a um, beekeeper, I love that, or a cottager, I'm a cottager too, or a gardener, or an athlete. I love this. Whoever you are, whatever you put here, and honestly, it's kind of giving me chills seeing all of these. I just love all of these. Whoever you are, you are the perfect person to care. If you're a Girl Scout or a Girl Scout leader, you're a perfect person. <laughs> if you're a grandfather, you're a perfect person. If you're an investor, you're a perfect person. If you care about justice, you're a perfect person. Whoever you are is the perfect person to care. And I love how the word human is centered right here. Because that's what we all have in common. We are all humans. And we all share this planet. And what we have in common is so much more than what divides us. And in order to solve and to tackle climate change, that's what we have to focus on. All right, a few more minutes here, and then we're gonna open it up to your questions. So talk about how climate change is affecting us and talk about what we can do to fix it. 
Because what builds efficacy is understanding that solutions are underway. It isn't just about the federal government or the Paris Agreement or the COP meetings. Countries are acting on their own. Many countries are acting. We also know that corporations are acting, many of them. We know that communities are acting. Army bases are taking action, churches, farmers. Young people are speaking out. And if they can speak out, can't we? Our own lives are changing. And I love telling people about how, you know, if you have a plug-in car, you don't have to go to the gas station during COVID. Or I love our local farmer's market. Or, you know, reducing our food waste is a great way that we can contribute to climate solutions. Or, you know, here's where I got my solar panels. Let me give you a recommendation. The world is changing and it is so inspiring to learn that, for example, 90% of new energy installed around the world during the COVID pandemic was clean energy. 90%. Much of it in places that don't have coal, oil, or gas resources, but they have wind and they have sun. The giant boulder of climate action we often picture as sitting at the bottom of an impossibly steep cliff with only a few hands on it. And it's not budging at all. So why bother adding mine? But when we realize how many people are already acting, how many schools, universities, cities, churches, corporations, companies, nonprofits, tribal nations, how many people are acting, we realize that giant boulder is at the top of the hill. It is rolling down the hill in the right direction. It already has millions of hands on it. And if you add yours, and if you use your voice to encourage others to add theirs, it will go faster. That is efficacy. The second question I'm asked is what gives you hope? And often we sit and we wait for hope to show up or we place our hope in a single politician or a single policy or a single action. And we are disappointed, bitterly disappointed. The rise of, of people who are convinced that they're doomed, which is rising exponentially right now, I think it's because we've put our hope in the wrong places and the wrong things and we've just been disappointed so many times that we've just given up. But here's the thing, we are only doomed if we give up. I'm a scientist and the science is clear that some of the impacts are already here, but the greater part is to come and they depend on our choices today. If we decide we're doomed, we will be doomed. But if we do everything we can, we will have a different future. When we place our hope though in positive news, we're not going to find positive news. When we place our hope in politics, we're not going to find a lot of encouragement in the fact that the United States is currently more politically divided than it has been since the Civil War in the 1800s. It is the most politically divided country in the world. Before the COVID pandemic, Climate change and environmental protection were the top two most politically polarized issues in the country. The width of the gray bar is how politically polarized they are. And now where are we? Well, today up at the top, we've got addressing issues around race, dealing with climate change and the COVID outbreak. Those are the most politicized issues. And the only reason why climate change isn't number one anymore is because Democrat concern dropped. Hope is not just shutting our eyes, sort of Pollyanna style. I don't know if you read this book when you were little, but I did, and it was very annoying. Shutting your eyes and hoping everything will be well. It's not imitating the proverbial ostrich and burying our head in the sand. Hope is not just saying everything's going to be okay because it is not going to be okay unless we do something about it. And when we get discouraged from focusing on our carbon footprint, I want to encourage you to focus instead on your climate shadow. How can we engage in the larger circles that we are part of and have a ripple effect on our neighbors, our family, people at our school, people where we work? How can we communicate real hope that begins by saying it's bad and it will get worse? There is a serious risk here. Success is not guaranteed, but there is a chance of a better future. And here is the path that we need to get there. And if we do our best, we will be different. We will get to something that's better than today, but only if we're determined to try.
Here's somebody who should know what she's talking about, Greta Thunberg. She said, the one thing we need more than hope is action. Why? Because once we start to act, hope is everywhere. How many of us are activated? 8%. How do we find hope? Through activation. And how do we knock over the first domino? What's the first step? The first step is something so simple, yet it's what, what we're not doing. It's having those conversations about why climate change matters and what we can do to fix it. Because if we don't talk about it, why would we care? And if we don't care, why would we ever do anything about it? George Marshall wrote this great book called Don't Even Think About It, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Ignore Climate Change. And in speaking with him just recently, he said a few things I want to share with you. He said, talk is the fertile field in which cultural change begins. In its absence, it's impossible for a group of people to solve a problem. Communication and talking obviously sometimes is writing, sometimes posting on social media, sometimes just doing something where other people see us do it. All of that is a form of communication. And that's the only way we can get together to solve a problem. Conversations underpin all climate action. Where people choose to invest their money, how they vote, what energy source they use, all these actions begin with what? The first domino, a conversation. Having conversations about climate change in our daily lives plays a huge role in creating social change. We take our cues about what's important from what we hear from our family, our friends, our colleagues, and our neighbors. And what's the goal? The goal is not to tell people about climate change. The goal is to expand the number of people who are in the conversation, to bring people in. I'm not talking about the 8% dismissives. I am talking about everybody else. I'm not talking about the Uncle Joes of this world who will go to their graves determined that it is a complete hoax created by the United Nations with the Antichrist behind them to take over the world. We can move on without the dismissives of the world. Why? Because the majority of us are worried. We just don't know what to do. And that's where our conversations are absolutely essential. So climate changes and we get worried. What do we do? Instead of loading up on scary facts, we share how it affects us and what real constructive solutions look like. Look at what your city is doing. Look at what your state is doing. Look at what a company that you're familiar with is doing. You will be amazed. I guarantee you will find some information you didn't know that you could share. People feel empowered. If they did that, I could do that too. If that organization did it, maybe our organization should too. I should talk to somebody about it. Action results. How does this jive with the way our brain works? Let's go back to the neuroscience. The human brain is built to associate forward action with a reward, not avoiding harm. So reframe your message so it induces hope, not dread. Not a false hope, not a hope that's pinned on a certain person or policy, but a hope that says it is bad, it will get worse, but there is the possibility of a better future if we do everything we can to get there. And so do not give up. Do not surrender to doom. If we do, that is the only thing that will doom us. Instead, join with others. Join with others who share your values, who share your concerns, encourage each other, work together for change, because that's the only way change happens. I wanna leave you with this quote. It's a quote I wrote after the last IPCC report came out. I said, when we look back through our modern industrialized society over the last few hundred years, changes do not begin with a big, rich, powerful person waking up one morning, like the King of England saying, oh, I guess I should just end slavery, or the President of the United States saying, hmm, it just occurred to me I should give women the vote, or the National Party of South Africa saying, yeah, let's just end apartheid, great idea. No. How did that change begin? It began decades before when ordinary people of no particular power, wealth, or fame decided the world could and should be different. Who were people like William Wilberforce, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, and all the thousands of others who shared and supported and fought for their visions of a better world? They were ordinary people who had the courage of their convictions, who did the one thing every one of us can do. We can use our voices to advocate for the systemic societal changes needed. We are the people who changed the world before, and we are the people who can change it again. 
Our future is quite literally in our hands. And so the only question now is, what are we waiting for? Last question to you. When I say climate change now, how do you feel? Give me a word. How do you feel? We still feel stressed. We still feel anxious. We still feel frightened. And I still feel those things myself. And you feel those for a reason, because we should be anxious. We should be worried. We should be concerned. But I love what's rising to the top here. We must be determined. We must be empowered. We must be motivated and we cannot be discouraged from action. Because only through our actions will we find hope. And that hope is the small chance of that better future. That is what we're fighting for for ourselves. And that's what we're fighting for on behalf of every living thing on this planet. So thank you so much. Um, love your feedback. And now's the time when you get to ask us questions. So Christine has a few that she's already prepared that she's going to be asking me about the latest IPCC report that just came out on Monday. But as we're talking, you can put your question in here. This will show up anytime. Um, and here's the fun part. You can upvote the questions you most want us to answer. And that's what I want you to do. We won't have time to answer everybody's questions, but we will have time to answer the questions that are most upvoted. So even if you don't have a question yourself, please go to polyv.com slash Catherine. Please read the questions other people are saying, and you can click on top to see them in order. And please click on the ones that you most want us to get to, and we will get to those. Thank you. Thanks so much, Catherine. Um, it, it is interesting to see those word clouds and that word determined uh, jumping out at us. It's very interesting. Uh, this is a week where a lot is going on and the world has been focused on the Ukraine and the war in Ukraine. But amidst that were news of a 3,600 page report from hundreds of scientists around the world, including the Ukraine, as you mentioned. And on the impacts of climate change, the news, not surprisingly, as the reports have piled in on a regular basis, is grim. And it says it said that there's a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. And it was also described as an atlas of human suffering and a damning indictment of failed climate leadership. What, what did you uh, find hopeful since you are in the business of looking for action and getting people hopeful and determined to act? Uh, there, there was a message in there that the future is not written in stone. But what did you see in this large and gloomy report? Well, the, the latest edition of the doorstops of doom, as I think about the IPCC report, it was, it was not a surprise to us scientists who have been following um, the science and the literature, but to see it all in one place is just overwhelming. To see all of the suffering that is already happening around the world, um, to see the massive injustice of how, and this report is very clear, how those who have contributed least to the problem are the ones who are bearing the brunt of the impacts. Um, it is overwhelming. And it's one of those situations where you just, you have to read it through, you have to digest it, you have to acknowledge how we feel about it. And then we have to say, what can we do? And the report is actually very clear it, that every action matters. Every bit of warming matters. Every ton of carbon matters. And if that is not an empowering message, I don't know what is. And that comes directly from the IPCC. Everything we do makes a difference to our future. And so what are we waiting for? Let's do it. Well, one, one other timely thing, last night, President Biden in the US gave his State of the Union address and he did address the importance of climate and passing climate legislation. How, how do you think the leadership of the world is doing and particularly how is the US doing in becoming a transformative leader? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a great website called Climate Action Tracker and I'll, I'll put a link here in the chat. Um, and I'll show it to you very briefly that tracks how different countries are doing. And in the United States, I often find the impression that people think, well, the United States is doing absolutely fantastic, A plus. What about all those other countries? Tisk, tisk. 
Well, unfortunately, that is not exactly the case. If you want to be able to, you know, take some credit for positive climate action, you have to be living in Bhutan or Morocco or Costa Rica. Those are the countries that are actually leading on climate action. And let me just show you the climate action tracker just very briefly here so you know what you're looking at. And then I'll put the link in the chat in a second so people can see it for themselves. Um, let me share my screen with you so you can see it. Here we go. This is, this is what the website looks like. And if you go to countries here, uh, you can actually see a map of the countries and how they're doing. And you can see that the United States is insufficient. Uh, much of Europe is insufficient. Large areas are highly insufficient in red. And there's only a few little, there's, there's um, none that are green, but there's a lot that are almost sufficient. But there are Costa Rica, Ethiopia, Kenya, Morocco, Nepal, Nigeria, the Gambia, United Kingdom is actually there too. So we have to step it up, but we have to step it up at every level. It isn't just countries, it's companies, cities, states, universities, organizations, all of us have something to do. So don't wait for the president to fix the problem for us. Every one of us can contribute. Well, one of our first questions is about social justice. And certainly in the uh, new scientific report, there was a strong emphasis on the fact that it is the poorer countries uh, that are suffering the most and they did the least to cause the problem. Um, talk a little bit about social inequity and climate change. So when we compare how climate change affects different countries, which is what the latest IPCC report does, we see that the lower income countries who've produced the least emissions are bearing the brunt of the impacts. Why? Because they're most vulnerable. When a flood happens, there's no National Guard. There's no insurance to pay for them to rebuild their homes. When drought strikes, there's no, you know, there's no grocery store to go get your food from to feed your family and don't have the money, even if there was one. Since the 1960s, climate change has already increased the economic gap between the richest and poorest countries in the world by as much as 25%. That has already happened. But these inequities are not only between countries, they're between people in the same cities. So here in the United States, for over 100 years, there were racist redlining practices, which left low-income neighborhoods covered in concrete with um, no public services, no um, accessible health care, with no green spaces, no trees, no parks, often built in a flood zone because that was the cheaper land. Well, heavy rainfall event happens. Who floods first? The people who live in the flood zone. A heat wave occurs. Which parts of the city heat up first and fastest? Those that don't have the trees, the shade, the grass. Formerly redlined areas, low-income neighborhoods of major cities in the US can be more than 10 degrees Fahrenheit hotter during a heat wave than the same, than um, low, higher income neighborhoods in the same city. And what does that translate into? It translates into heat stress on our bodies. It translates into health emergencies hospitalizations and even deaths. It translates into much higher air conditioning bills that people can't afford to pay. It translates into situations where people feel unsafe. They can't open their window at night to cool off. They can't pay their AC bill. And all of this happens because the people have contributed the least to the problem. The 3.5 billion poorest people in the world have contributed to 7% of the problem, yet they're bearing the brunt of the impacts. And so that was why I became a climate scientist myself. When I learned that, that was what made me decide I have to do everything I can to help fix this problem. And in the latest Working Group 2 report, we finally see the figures, the graphs, the maps, and the text that lays out clearly and unmistakably that this is a justice issue. Well, in, in fact, um, this important point about justice has been made throughout the reports and is certainly one of the issues that we will be dealing with in the years to come. Uh, several of the questions, the number one, uh, 20 votes for, what is the most effective strategy for having conversations about climate change with people who don't necessarily want to engage? And we know, as you have pointed out, mostly people are not talking about mm -hmm. climate enough. They're talking about other issues. How, what's an, a strategy for how you would approach speaking to someone about why they should care about climate change and actually do something about it. 
Yes. So I've put a bunch of resources in the chat. Uh, my TED Talk, my book is obviously all about that as well. Um, and I helped to co-create a climate action website to go with the Don't Look Up movie that was on Netflix. And it's really good on this too. So I put a bunch of resources over there in the chat that you can click on and save. But in a nutshell, it isn't about telling people they should care. It's showing them that they already care. They just didn't realize it. And that's the sea change I was talking about near the beginning of the presentation. We don't have to make people care for the same reasons we do. We just have to show them that who they already are is already the perfect person to care. And you might say, well, how do you do that? By finding out what makes them tick. So I was um, doing the, the audio version of Saving Us. I was in a studio here in Lubbock, Texas over the weekend reading the whole thing in three days with a single sound engineer helping out. And after the first three or four hour session, I came out and he said, oh, I didn't realize it was a book about climate change. I have some questions. So I would put him in the doubtful category. If he was dismissive, he wouldn't have any questions for me. He would just have things he wanted to say, like it's the sun and it's volcanoes and you scientists are all making it up. That's how you can tell. But this, this man said he had questions. He wasn't on board, so he was definitely doubtful, but he had questions. So I said, sure, I'd be happy to talk with you. But I started instead. I was like, you know, how long have you lived here? What do you enjoy doing? Tell me about, learn about his life. I learned that there's this place he grew up going fishing and he's seen how it has changed over 30, 40 years. He was a skier and he's seen how the ski places have changed over 30, 40 years, how the snows become a lot patchier, how the waters have become more polluted. So I, I listened to him tell me what he cared about. And then I said, yes, I care about that too. And I've noticed this happening. He's like, yes, I've noticed that happening too. And I said, well, did you know that's, that's why I care about climate change? <laughs> and you care about the same issues too. So beginning the conversation with something we have in common. In my book, I tell a story about how um, a, a NASA scientist came up to me after one of my talks and said, I want to talk about this with my friends because I studied this, but I don't know where to start. So I said, what do you do with your friends? What do you enjoy doing? And he said, well, we cook together. We do a lot of cooking. We have a lot of dinner parties. I said, perfect, food. Start with food. Talk about how climate change is affecting specialty crops like chocolate or coffee or beer or wine. Talk about how increasing CO2 in the atmosphere is decreasing the nutritional quant quality of food and affecting people in some of the poorest parts of the world. Talk about how natural climate solutions help farmers enrich their soil, put carbon in the soil where we want it instead of the atmosphere where we don't, and grow more food. Talk about food. And then another woman came up to me and said, how do I talk about it with my grandma? So I said, well, what do you do with your grandma? And she said, we knit together. I said, well, perfect, because of course I'm a knitter too. I said, have you heard of the warming stripes? The warming stripes are this wonderful graphic created by Ed Hawkins, who's a climate scientist. And I'll, sh I'll give you the website where you can look up the warming stripes for your city or state or country right here in the chat. And it's a stripe for every year, and it's blue if the year is colder than average, and if it's red if the year is warmer than average. And I'll show you what it looks like. It looks like, um, once I show you, you'll be like, oh yeah, that's what it is. It looks like this. And you can see, obviously, we go from blue to red, right? And this is for the globe, but you can zoom in. You can zoom in on North America. You can zoom in on the United States. You can zoom in on, since you're hosting, we'll do Massachusetts. I said, find the warming stripes for the place where your grandma grew up and knit a scarf together and get her to tell you stories about all the like extremely cold years or hot years as she grew up. And then as you get to the end, it gets redder and redder. And then you can say how grandma, how different is it than when you grew up? And there's even a company called Tempestry that puts together the kits for you if you don't wanna find the wool on your own. So the bottom line is everybody who's a human has every reason to care. And we can have conversations with anyone who's not dismissive. The dismissives are only seven or 8% of the population. And why can't we have a good conversation with them? It's because they won't listen. And a conversation takes two people. So with, with people I know who are dismissive, and we all have them, even in our own family. In my book, I tell the story of a family member I have. I say, I love you, but we have to talk about something else. But again, they're seven or 8% of the population. With everybody else, figure out what they already care about, connect the dots to climate change and bring in a positive constructive solution that will make them go, wow, I had no idea about it. I really like that. One of the other questions is about the tendency to put hope in the hands of the younger generation. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that in your talk. 
Uh, the youth movement has been very important as a spark plug for action, but it, it makes, according to this question, makes adults complacent and partially the reason for inaction. So how do we uh, get all generations to be involved in taking actions uh, to promote fixes for climate change? Mm -hmm. It's really interesting because I started to ask people what gives you hope using this Poll Everywhere software that I have. And I collected about seven or 800 answers in about seven, seven or eight different audiences. And the number one answer that 25% of people gave was some version of the next generation, young people, teens, my kids, my grandchildren, other people's kids, my students. So I sat down, I started to ask people, why is it that they give you hope? Is it because you think they're gonna fix it for you and because they're so active? And just about everybody said, well, I'm glad they're so active, but no, we need to fix it for them. The reason they give us hope is because they are a symbol of the future. Children are a symbol of our future. And in my book, I talk about a movie in a P.D. James novel um, that came out a while ago called Children of Men, where a global flu pandemic swept around the world. Doesn't sound so much like fiction now, does it? And as a result, they started to realize that people were having less and less children. Then all of a sudden there were no children at all. There was no children. And one of the characters was reflecting, saying, you know, all too soon words like justice and truth will just be, you know, they won't even be sounds in the wind anymore. People won't even exist. So why bother? Children embody the future to us. They give us hope because we are fighting for us and for them and for our future. And every single one of us has something to do. And what encouraged me the most when I went to COP in Glasgow was there were all the countries there, but there were also companies there. There were indigenous peoples there. There were grandparents there. There were toddlers there. There were Rotarians there. There were theologians there. Every single type of person you could imagine around the world was there because we understand finally that climate change matters to all of us and that whoever we already are is the perfect person to care. So how do we activate people? Figure out who they are and what they care about. Are they a passionate you know, angler or hunter? Are they really into gardening? Are, do they love technology? Are they a veteran or did they do military service? Are they a person of faith? Whoever they are, connect the dots. And you can bring up military leaders and what they say about climate change or faith leaders and what they say about climate change. You can bring up you know, our Science Moms organization. I'll put that in the chat too because I'm really fond of that. You can see how we, we um, you can't watch the Science Moms uh, videos without a Kleenex because the emotion is so clear that we're, we're doing this because we care, because it's where our hearts are. So what we have to do is we have to take our heads, which are worried, connect them to our hearts, why we care, and then connect our hearts and others' hearts to our hands so we act. It's the heart to hand connection that is the biggest gap. One question is about fossil fuels and how we move away from them. And certainly one of the hopeful stories has been the growth, the rapid growth in clean energy usage, more efficient, more cost-effective. Uh, how do we uh, push this movement away from fossil fuels to a faster pace than we have right now? So as you know, and as the question alludes to, the fossil fuel industry is currently subsidized to the tune of, I think, $650 billion a year in the United States alone, which exceeds the Pentagon's budget. It is not a free market. And just about every economist in the world, including the two who won the Nobel Prize in 2018, agree that putting a price on carbon is the number one policy action that would spur innovation and growth in clean energy. So in Canada, we have a price on carbon. And in fact, in several dozen countries and states around the world, there is already a price on carbon. In the US, there's sort of like a shadow price on carbon just because of different points of legislation that there are. Um, but, and that's why, for example, there's a great organization, and there might be some people listening who are familiar with it or part of it, called Citizens Climate Lobby. And they're all about ordinary people using their voices to advocate to their elected officials for a price on carbon, which is one of many solutions that we need. And again, I don't want to give away too many stories, but this great stories in the book about how individual people um, through organizations like Citizens Climate Lobby or through their own actions as well or through working together with others in the place where they work or the school that they go to or the church that they're at, how individuals have been able to make a difference because we need system change, but a system is made up of individuals. 
How does the system change when individuals focus on their climate shadow, right? How can we engage, how can we create a ripple effect where we are? So you might not be the child of a Republican congressman, but there was a guy called Mark who was. And so when he turned 18, he said to his dad, dad, I would like to vote for you, but you're wrong about climate change. And I can't vote for you unless you take another look at it. So his dad did because his son said that to him. And because of that, he completely flipped on climate change. His name is Bob Inglis. And he now heads a um, organization called Republic N, E N, that's all about clean energy and carbon pricing. Um, why, is, why are organizations like Amazon taking action? It's not because the CEO decided one day to, it's because people who work there use their voices. Why are organizations divesting from fossil fuels? It's because people who work there use their voices. People using their voices is the most powerful force that we have. It has changed our world before and it will change it again. And every single one of us has a voice, including a little nine-year-old boy from Toronto, uh, where I'm from, who interviewed me for his YouTube show. He <laughs> was worried, like most pe young people are. 86% of young people are really worried about climate change. And so his mom, being a wise mom, said, well, what could you do about it? And so he came up with the idea of doing this YouTube podcast. And so she helps him sort of, you know, send the emails, organize the guests, um, helps him write out the questions. He does all the interviews and edits the videos and posts them. And just because it's so cute, I'll, let me just um, share a link to that right here so you'll see. But I mean, goodness sakes, if a nine-year-old boy can use his voice for climate action, <laughs> what can the rest of us do? We can all do something. And I was just speaking to someone the other day who... Um, who is, uh, you know, much older than me and has been concerned about climate change for a long time, has an electric vehicle, composts, uses clean energy, gardens. And she said, until she read my book, she said she didn't realize that it was all about her carbon footprint and no ripple effect, no climate shadow. She realized the missing piece is that I'm not talking to my friends. I'm not saying, hey, I love my EV and here's what it does for me. Or because I compost this and we reduce our food waste, this is what's happening. She realized she wasn't talking about it. And that was the missing piece. That's what takes it from one person to 100 people, from 100 people to 1,000 people, from 1,000 people to the world. Using our voice, again, is the most powerful tool we have. And while you're asking me the next question, Christine, I'm just going to find that, 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 that nine-year-old boy's YouTube um, video and put that up so you can watch it and be encouraged. <laughs> that is inspirational. Um, one of the questions is about the thought that acting on climate change is unrealistic or too expensive, uh, whereas ignoring it may also be too expensive. What, what can we do about the fact that people think it's too hard or too expensive to actually move on climate change. There we go. It used to be back in the 1970s and 80s. And so usually if somebody says that, you don't, like when somebody says something, you don't wanna make them feel stupid or dumb because if you do, then that's the end of the conversation. So I would usually say to somebody, you're right. It's a great way to begin a conversation. <laughs> you're right. It used to be that way. But there's great news, see, immediately pivoting to we can do this. There's great news um, that things are changing. Did you know that solar energy is now the cheapest form of electricity we've ever had in the history of the world? And they might say, no, I have no idea. Did you know that they're building the biggest solar farm in the whole United States just outside DFW in Texas? And Texas already has more wind energy than any other state in the country. Talking about Texas, I love doing that because it surprises people. Telling stories is really important because it helps to synchronize our brainwaves with each other and it helps us empathize with each other. And there are so many stories to tell about how clean energy is revolutionizing the lives of people in sub-Saharan Africa who don't have fossil fuel resources, about how it's being implemented in low-income neighborhoods here, how big corporations are using it, how individual people are, how solar panels on your roof are genuinely contagious. The number one predictor of whether someone has solar is if somebody else has it within a mile of their house. So there's all kinds of stories we can tell showing people that the world has changed, but begin by saying, you're right, it used to be that way, but there's some amazing things I'd love to share with you. Did you know? Again, did you know? Not, I can't believe you will know, but did you know that this and this? Did you know that this is what the army's doing? Did you know that this is what this business is doing? Did you know that this is what we're doing? <laughs> did you know that this is what this university is doing? 
Share the good news, share the no-brainer solutions that make everybody go, wow, why not? Because it doesn't matter if we agree on the science, what matters is if we agree on the solutions. A couple of years ago, I was visiting a farmer south of here, and I noticed that, a cotton farmer, and I noticed that as many farmers do around here, he had a few oil pumps on his land, but his neighbor had wind turbines. So after we had sort of gotten to know each other, we were there to talk about the drought. Um, and you know, we figured we knew a few people in common. I sort of gathered up my courage and I said, is there a reason, I noticed your neighbor has wind turbines up to the boundary of the, your land. Is there a reason you don't have them? And it was very clear that he was strongly in the doubtful category. He didn't think climate change is real. He wasn't gonna bombard me with, you know, it's the sun, it's volcanoes, you're making it up. So he wasn't dismissive, he was definitely doubtful. Is there a reason you don't have wind turbines? And he said, yes. And so I gathered up what was left of my courage and I said, why? <laughs> and I was expecting, you know, a diatribe on, you know, wind turbines and all the terrible evils that they create. But instead he said, it's because my neighbor signed up before me and he didn't tell me and I've been waiting two years for my wind turbines. <laughs> And so I said, oh, you want them? And he's like, well, of course, the check shows up in the mail. And these, these oil people are always driving on and off my land because they have to come collect the oil and they're messing up my, my roads and my, and my crops. The wind turbines, they set them up and they push the button in Florida. Of course I want wind turbines. And so I don't care if that man thinks climate change is real. I don't care at all. All I care about is he really wants those turbines. And once he gets them, he's going to tell everybody else he knows what a great thing it is to have those turbines on his land. Yeah, it's amazing. Texas has so much clean energy as well as uh, fossil fuels, and the two sometimes get mixed up. Uh, what, what would you think are top five suggestions for the average American? And you've gone over many of them in the talk, but maybe just summarizing what you would tell the average citizen here, this is what you can do, or this is what you can think about doing. I can absolutely do that because that's exactly what I helped uh, Netflix do for the Don't Look Up Climate Action website. So normally when you go to a climate action website, you've got change your light bulbs and recycle, you've got efficient appliances, plant-based diet, uh, transportation, less flying, you've got a lot of personal actions, right? That are about your carbon footprint, which is this big. Or if you have bigger feet, this big. Now, don't get me wrong, personal actions are important and I take them. But the most important thing that they accomplish is they change me and they change others around me. When I got an EV, the most important thing I did was I plugged that EV in outside the house so my neighbors could see it. That was the most <laughs> important thing I did. When I cut my food waste, the most important thing I do is tell people, wow, food waste is a huge part of, did you know, and here's how I cut my food waste and here's these companies that give you ugly fruit or things that are past this due date. So when you go to this website, I'm going to share this website with you, you're not going to see those personal actions front and center. What are you going to see? Well, first of all, you'll see Leonardo DiCaprio, obviously, looking anxious, as we all are. And then you'll see our top six actions. And these are based on social science of change. How do we as individuals spend our time and our resources most effectively to change the world? Number one, talk about it. And there's a lot more here if you click on this. Number two, join a group of people so you're not alone. Boost your impact. Number three, make your money count. Where you bank, where your pension fund is, where your um, you know, retirement savings are, what credit cards you use. I cut up two of my credit cards last year when I found out that they came from the bank that provides the most fossil fuel funding um, of any bank. Keep politicians accountable. You know, did you know that only 0.5% of elected officials in the US are federal? 0.5%. So your chances of talking to a city council person, your chances of talking to a state representative, your chances of talking to somebody at a different level are astronomically higher. I'm not saying don't talk to representatives and senators, definitely do, but they're only 0.5% and cities and states can make decisions much more quickly than the federal level, and they are. Spark ideas at work, use your voice at work, push for climate headlines. And then if you go down and you click on see all steps, then we have Cut food waste, eat more veggies, switch to clean energy, get around greener, fly less, be kind to your mind. Oh, definitely click on that one. That's a really good one. <laughs> Burned out people are not gonna save the planet from burning. And we all have to take that time to acknowledge how we feel, to remind ourselves of what we're fighting for. And so that's why, despite everything I do, I make sure that 
I do the things that I love. I spend time with the people I love. I spend time in the outdoors that I love. I remind myself of why this matters, why, why I care, what I'm fighting for. And I return to the fight rejuvenated and refreshed because that's what matters in life. Well, it's interesting that you've got an electric car. It's amazing how quickly that industry has taken off and that that is really the future um, EVs and not just for individual cars, but for larger transportation. What advice can you give about uh, local action? As you just pointed out, most politicians are not at the federal level. A number of cities around the world have been declaring climate emergency actions. Mm -hmm. And what, what do you see as the effectiveness of these climate emergency declarations? So there are many things that cities can do. They can join, um, there's the Mayor's Climate Pledge. There's an organization called ICLE. Um, there's also declaring a climate emergency. And then there's even a climate action plan. So I just helped the city of Houston just before the pandemic create their first ever climate action plan. And it is such an encouraging document. If you want to find some hope, Houston, the fourth largest city in the United States, home to the oil and gas industry, incredibly vulnerable to stronger hurricanes, heat waves, heavy rainfall events and floods and sea level rise. Yet it has an amazing climate action plan with all kinds of concrete steps of what they're going to do to improve the lives of their citizens today as well as tomorrow. So climate emergency, I think, leads to, uh, is often a precursor, not a necessary precursor, but often a precursor to a climate action plan. And it's a concrete ask. So let me just look up the Houston one because it's so encouraging. I would really, you know, if you're looking for something good to read, <laughs> read the climate action plan. You're like, wow, if Houston can do this, why can't we do this? <laughs> um, just a second here. I'll give you the link and then you can just click on the PDF yourself to read it. Here we go. Um, cities are very nimble. C cities can take a lot of action. And so this is probably a great story to end on. Um, I did my TED talk and it was released in December 2018. And my TED talk was on how the most important thing you can do about climate change is talk about it because we're not. So there was a man called Glenn who lived in a suburb of London, England called Wandsworth. Um, I think about 200,000 people ish, maybe a bit less. He lived in a suburb of, of, of London and he had been trying so hard to get a city to move and they just weren't doing anything. And he was frustrated and discouraged and probably anxious as well. And he watched my TED talk that said the most important thing we can do is talk about it. So he said, fine, that's what I'll do. So in May, I was in London to do one of my bundled trips where I line up all different events and I fly over and I do like, I don't know, like a dozen, two dozen, I think my max is actually 29 and six days <laughs> events um, around the same place to maximize my carbon and my time and make every bit of it count. So I was giving the last talk of the day at the London School of Economics and I was pretty tired by that point. I think it was number six of the day. So I was walking back down the aisle and I couldn't wait to put my feet up and get a cup of tea. And I saw this man who was obviously waiting to speak with me. So I stopped and he introduced himself, it was Glenn. And he said, I watched your TED talk. And ever since I did that, I've been talking to people about climate change. I was like, well, that's wonderful. It's been, you know, five, five and a half months. That's so encouraging to hear that somebody, you know, that it's making a tangible difference. And he said, and I've been keeping a list of how many people I spoke to. Would you like to see it? I thought, well, that's new. I've never seen anybody keep a list before. I said, well, of course I would love to see it. And so he reached in his leather satchel and I expected him to pull out a list of maybe, you know, 75 or 80 people. He pulled out a list of 10,000 people. Because when he had conversations with people, then he said, you have conversations. And then when they had conversations, then you have conversations. And they wrote down all their names. All of these people were in his city. And by May, after 10,000 conversations, the city had voted to declare an emergency, a climate emergency. By the next year, they had voted to put 20 million pounds, which is a lot for a small, uh, a small uh, borough, into climate resilience and adaptation planning. And as I, when I wrote my book, I checked back in with Glenn. He said he had about 13,000 names. They're still keeping the conversations going. One man started that. And if he did that, what else could we do? Thank you so much. This has been a great conversation with you. Uh, there was a question about the recording. There will be a recording available. And I really want to thank the great audience. We had a tremendous response to this talk and it really has been 
inspirational for all of us. So thank you again, Catherine. Hey ho, really, really great. Thank you for having me. And I have one last suggestion if anybody's interested. If you want to start a conversation, start a book discussion group around my book, Saving Us. There you go. It's a perfect conversation starter. I've got a copy. Maybe I can do that. Anyway, thank you so much. And uh, we really appreciate your time. Thank you. And thank you everyone for being here.